There is little or nothing I can tell you about our speaker tonight that you don't already know. Dr. Chris Pugley is a much respected uh, and distinguished military historian. His reputation is international and here in our country he is looked on with great respect and regard. He has written 22 books um, on the military history and papers, etc., and in 2015 was appointed an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit. We are privileged to hear from him about our country's darkest day. Please welcome Dr. Chris Pugsley. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I honestly didn't think it was going to cross the start line, uh, but I'm pleased it did, and I'm pleased to be here. And uh, um, appropriately enough, on the 12th, but really, uh, the 12th, 11th, 13th, 4th, uh, those October days were hard yakka and hell for everyone. And so this evening I'm going to look at Third Battle of Peep, uh, Passion Now, like the song, has connotations. And hey, Pluma, the generals, you know, were, were they uh, donkeys or something else? Um, lots of good pictures, but hopefully they will tell a story. And so Passchendaele, in perspective, including the... Uh, New Zealand division within that. Why Flanders? Why Passchendaele? Uh, this wasn't Haig's obsession, even though he became obsessed by it. In uh, late 1916, unrestricted U-boat warfare, and you can see the U-boat bases along the Belgian and French coasts, uh, was such that the British government said that it's vital for the successful conduct of the war uh, that sea communications be maintained. And directed the British Expeditionary Force to focus on securing the occupation of Austin and Zeebrugge, which were the two main bases. And so after the Somme, and the lessons of the Somme in 1916, uh, the focus was to the north. And that, after the initial, and um, Ypres, uh, Vauban's fortified uh, town in uh, Belgium on the traditional route for war. At some point, somewhere from the Romans, they had fought over this particular town. And there's, when you go to Ypres and uh, you go either along the Menin Road or out towards uh, uh, Paul Capel or Langemark, you come to an insignificant banana shaped bridge, which you'll see shortly. And that is the strategic high ground of Belgium. And uh, at Sandhurst, there are a set of Hague's planning maps, three-dimensional, and they're the ones that are used for this battle. And I used to ponder on the little holes that were on this fairly insignificant rise and consider what he was thinking about when his staff was sticking the flags in it. But I talk too much. Let's show some pictures. And so... After the Somme, 1916, we're moving north. And there you see Flanders, and there you see Ostend and Zeebrugge. 
the key components and just under the Flanders you should be able to pick up Ipa Ip and and there we are there's that banana shaped ring of hills and look at the battles of Ip and you've got uh, Pofferinge and the railway line the key logistic link to the Eep salient, and then those series of lines that show the immediate defence uh, being driven, uh, the advance forward, and you'll see Passchendaele uh, out there in the in the top uh, right corner, and you'll see that line which marks November. 1917, when the Canadians finally take Passchendaele, and then see how uh, that black line close to, uh, the closest line to Ypres, is where we're driven back to in the March-April Kaiser offensive. And so, uh, but that critical line of low hills is what preoccupies us and all war is a battle for communications. And the question that Haig and his generals had to answer was, how do we achieve the fall of Seebrugger and Austin, and how do we clear the Belgian coast? Well, cut the German railway communications. And, um, if you look, oh, I've allowed it, I think. How are we going to do it? And this is, is first of all, we're going to secure the sock shoulders. Messine, Wishart Ridge, we've got to hold that angle to protect that railway line through Pofferidge. And Plumer of Second Army, Daddy Plumer, big. Uh, red face, bulbous moustache, classic Colonel Blip, uh, perhaps the most effective general, one of the most effective generals in Haig's army, is preparing for that through the stalemate of 1916. He's going to, and uh, he's using mines to go under the German front line, and once he's got that secure, the next step for Haig is using Goff, cavalryman Herbert Goff, to push out on the other side to secure that flank and advance towards Langemark. And then Goff gets caught up in the rain and Goff uh, has a well-trained army, but his planning staff can't match it. And after the, his failures in August, Plumer takes over and pushes through on the centre and right. And then they push on towards Ruler, which is uh, the key German logistic railway. And there you see... Uh, the advance on that, and that railway line, you can just see the dotted railway lines. I apologise, I should have one of these little uh, magic things that uh, uh, I can point it out to you. But And at the same time, the French and Belgian armies will then attack out from the coast, and Wallinson's army was contemplated to do an amphibious landing, all very ambitious. Uh, certainly, Messines, uh, which is really New Zealand's first major uh, <coughs> involvement where they get into the planning, and Russell, Andrew Russell, shows his. Uh, ability as a divisional commander and a tactician and 
right throughout 1917, when the battles for Ypres are going on, uh, of course, things are falling apart elsewhere. Russia goes out of the war, the revolution, Italy is having problems, uh, and Lord George is suspicious of generals anyway, and there's Hay having a friendly discussion with Joff and Lord George, and Hay is asked by Lord George, should we keep this going or hang tight? And Hay wants to push on. And so 17 is the year which we recognize as Passchendaele, but Passchendaele is only one of the battles. And we're talking about five British armies. And if you look at those armies, a division is small potatoes. Hague's at the top, five armies, the one we're particularly interested in is Plumer's second army, which uh, has the two Anzac Corps within it. One Anzac, which is essentially the Australian Corps under Birdwood, and uh, Alexander Godley, who sets up the New Zealand Territorial Force, superb trainer, administrator, and politician, uh, commands a mixed second Anzac Corps of four divisions. And these four divisions are part of our story. Uh, at the time of the October battles, he's got the 49th British Division, the 66th British Division, and then the two Anzac Divisions, under Russell, the New Zealand Division, and Monash, John Monash, who would later command the Australian Corps, commanding 3rd Australian Division. And in 1917, from through all that battles, the uh, New Zealand Division always attacked on the left with Monash's division on the right, and that was more than just, uh, that's the way it was, and I submit it, it happened like that because, as Haig said to Allenby when he was made army commander, you pick your best man and you give him the most difficult ground. And if you look at Messine and you look at Bellevue Spur, uh, as we will in a moment, that was the most difficult ground and Andrew Russell was by far the best man. You should all leap your feet and start shouting at that point. Um, and of course, these are not lions led by donkeys. The donkeys, there are thinking generals that have learned from their mistakes. And by 1917, particularly after the song, uh, that's Haig's instructions to his army commanders. The key is artillery, because artillery keeps advancing infantry alive by suppressing the enemy's artillery fire, by cutting the wire, and by the moving barrage that keeps the machine gunners' heads down, particularly when it's intermingled with smoke, so that in the last 100 yards, 100 metres, the platoons can fight their way forward, outflank each of these machine gun posts, and knock out pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And all of this has developed in 1917, not just with the Australians or the New Zealanders or the Canadians, but in every division, and the only difference between the divisions wasn't the doctrine, but the individual capability of the divisional command. The, a fish here, a fish stinks from the head. And it's the same in every department, bureaucracy, or army. 
And so don't exhaust the infantry and allow them to be still capable because of the artillery support to uh, beat off the German counterattacks. There we are. And I talked about 16. Plumer's preparing for Messine. Messine, outstanding success. And look at it. Oh, there, there's, there's you know, uh, the classic donkey, yet with Tim Harrington, outstanding uh, commander and competitor working under Goff. It was a pleasure working for Plume because he, Harrington's preparation and planning uh, was very good. And don't worry about the detail, that's the scene. But look at the number of divisions. There are 13 divisions, four corps in one army. Now, each division approximately 16 to 20,000. Four divisions in the corps, larger than Wellington's army at Waterloo, under Godley, under Birdwood, largest division in the British Army in 1917, standard, usually three brigades each of four battalions of 1,000, 4,600 with odds and sods, was the New Zealand division because it had four brigades. So four fours of 16, plus the artillery and everything else, a strong 20,000 plus. And so, and I could wax eloquent, but I've got too many slides, and so I won't. And so let's, and Harrington instilled standards that Russell, Monash, were determined to meet and use, and trust, Trust that the planning has been done properly and they've worked out how to keep men alive in achieving the objective. Training, training at every level. At the basic level, building up to platoon, company, battalion, brigade, all watched by Russell. And there he's talking to uh, junior officers of young, daddy young, guy behind Russell on the, uh, as we look at it on the left, uh, a dentist from Martin, seven children. I'm sure Mrs. Young was quite pleased that he went off to war. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. But there he is. And Russell would inspect platoons and want his platoon commander to name every man and tell him something about it. He was particular. Thoroughness. Thoroughness to make sure that his men trust that his headquarters staff can do their job. And there they are, training for machine. Notice they're in single file. They're training for a night attack on a piece of ground that has been deliberately picked to represent the actual battlefield and on the hill all the trenches that they're attacking have been spit locked up so they're actually on the ground and each of those platoons and see back up the slope they're coming down that's a brigade in training uh, each commander at section level of 12 men have got a map which details the part of the enemy position there to capture and they turn it over and there's a message form on the back so that they can send it back to their boss and say we're in position. All thought through and notice the yellow line and the black line. When Russell explained the scene, the capture of the scene, key piece of ground, that's why the New Zealand has got the job, Monash is to the right, and he can't get on unless the scene is taken. See how 
there is a loop around the town because Russell wants to bypass Messine, seize the black line, exploit to the dotted line, and only put enough men into the town itself who can find shelter in the cellars. Because German counter-battery fire, once they realize Messine is taken, is going to pound Messine to brick dust. And that's exactly what happened. And Haig initially wants Russell to do the standard take it inch by inch. Russell nods wisely and does as he's planned and earns Haig's attention from that point on. Operations today among those 13 divisions are probably the most successful I have undertaken. And so this sets the scene. This opens the battles of 30. And the Germans are on the defense. They're heavily embroiled in Russia. They're supporting the Austro-Hungarians. They're all both there and in Italy. And they have changed the deep lines of trenches to a Swiss cheese, like acne on a young boy's face, where you look at the pimples, and connecting those pimples are those pillboxes. And those pillboxes aren't firing positions, but they hold 30 to 40 Germans with five or six machine guns. And once our artillery lifts, they come out into the shell holes and open fire. And there's belts of wire. This was painted by Butler in 1918. He went back over the battlefields but he's captured the remnants of the wire. But if you can imagine a wire, in some cases, 30 meters thick, with deliberate lanes left between them, which are the killing fields for the machine guns. And the depth, and we'll have a see that uh, on the, for the 12th of October, one to two kilometers so that the British artillery, at some point, have to weaken their fire so that the batteries can keep in touch with the advancing infantry. And at that point, the German counter-attack battalions, also already in position, whack them. And that's why Hay gave that talk about protecting your infantry, don't exhaust them, don't ask them to go too far. And so all of this, it's a two-sided game. And so even the best laid plans will see good men die. That's the reality of war. And so how are we doing? Oh, not too bad. Let's go. And of course, I was talking small detail. Eep. The blue line is our front line. Imagine each of those red lines, if you look at the key at the top right, that's your, in some cases, uh, defensive Swiss cheese. Uh, each line sets out to achieve what I described just before. And of course, we're going to be interested in the Flandern one. Boots the end, 4th of October, uh, uh, and behind Boots the end, just over the ridge, uh, you've got Bellevue Spur, and of course, the first battle, a fa fashion battle. And so the Germans are concreting all the Belgian farmland, which by this stage is wall to wall, shell hole to shell hole, um, wasteland, breaking all the drainage, and ironically, August, wet, September, 
driest September for about 50 years. The biggest problem in September at Eep is dust and lack of water. And then just when the Anzacs, well no, no, the Australians have their outstanding veterans in September, but then in October, New Zealand Division comes on 4th of October, great day for everyone, and then it bloody rains. And of course, turns it into a morass, and after three victories in a row, they head off to Sydney to get, uh, or was it, was it Sydney? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. But they want a clean sweep, and you can guess what's coming. And so, where is he? And Flandern one is what's going to preoccupy us in a moment. And at a tactical level, that's a page out of the platoon in the attack, which is issued to every platoon commander. And there's also the battalion in the attack and uh, the division in the attack. And I used to issue a, a copy of that pamphlet to each of the cadets at Sandhurst. And we would, and they would have to read it. And then I would get them to say, discuss what was different to the present day platoon in the attack pamphlet. And there's no difference. It's only a first generation weapon, weapons being used compared to where we are in the 21st century. And so this is not blind, unthinking attacks in the mud. This is cutting edge technology allied to tactics on both sides. And it's the one who loses sight or starts to rush it that falters. And Goff in August faltered. And Pluma against in the battles of Lammermark. And, uh, you know, the cost is obvious. And so Bir uh, Birdwood, it's one at Insect Corps, is part of the attacks on the centre and right flank in late September on the two attacks on the 20th and 26th of September the battles of Men and Road outstanding success and while I mention the Anzacs he's, uh, it's one of 10 attacking divisions you know our problem as New Zealanders or Australians is John Monash won the war, or, you know, the only person that suffered on the 12th of October was the New Zealand Division. We forget the other 12 divisions that were fighting in that same battle, uh, working under the same time constraints. Uh, but we'll get on to that too. But, and so... Plumer's second army is got a tactical process that's winning. And the Germans are worried. And so for the 4th of October, which they know is coming, they don't know quite when, but against Rutsien, uh, Graventafel, Abraham Heights, they stack the front line. And they move their counter-attack divisions forward, or battalions forward, and gets caught in a massed artillery fire. Ten brigades of artillery supporting the New Zealanders alone. I wonder if there was enough for everyone else, but there was. And as the New Zealanders went forward, they said, never seen so many dead Germans in the shell holes. And so... And Haig is getting quite excited because it's still fine. But let's not, let's not anticipate too much. 
Hague is, as I see, aiming for Berla and Staten to break the railway line. Because, as he said, if we could destroy or interrupt for 48 hours the railway rulers, there would probably be a debacle because the enemy would then have to rely on only one railway line for the supply of his troops between Ghent and the sea. So he will be forced to withdraw and it will allow us to clear the submarine base. So it's not all, it's to an end. And the end makes sense. Passchendaele had a logical reason for being fought. And this time on the 4th, 2nd Anzac, under Alexander Gobby, joins the battle. And there they are at the New Zealand Division Horseshoe. Fine horses, stout, stocky men, um, and he Haig has a word in Godly's ear. He wants him to be ready to export. Uh, the guns should be placed behind Gravenstaffel Hill, and that's where the New Zealand monument is at the Gravenstaffel crossroad at Brutsien. And the reserve brigades of his divisions of 2nd Anzac Corps should be ready to push on once they've beaten back the German counterattacks. And so, and then Hay calls in his two armies, commanders. This is a 2nd Army battle with 5th Army of Goff. And the next one on the 9th, is planned to be a three-army battle because Antoine's French army will also be part of it. So within that context, the division is important, but only in control of its piece of realism. And we sometimes forget that. Why did they bloody do it? because they were part of a much bigger plan. And there we are. Just remind you of that structure, and there's going to be two battles, and Godley is going to rotate his New Zealand and Australian division with his two British divisions. All have had the opportunity to train, and practice the new tactics and they're ready to go. And, and Russell is confident that after uh, training his battalions throughout September that his New Zealanders are ready for battle. And Monash is the same. And as I said, look at Brutzi end on the 4th it's going to take two armies, six corps, 13 divisions, and for the New Zealanders alone, 10 brigades of artillery and support. And they're in the right position behind uh, uh, Dohi Farm, who's been to Dohi Farm Cemetery. It, 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 when you're allowed to go to France again, the best view for the 4th of October is Dohi Farm Cemetery because you can see the Banana Ridge and you can work out why the Aucklanders were sucked off over the border into the other divisions area and into the other armies area and left a gap in the centre where the Wellingtons had to fill and it's all there and of course they've rebuilt the farms where all the pillboxes were because the pillboxes were built on those farms anyway. And so it's all laid out to you as a glorious panorama. And there in the centre is the battle memorial uh, to uh, Brutzi and to the New Zealand division on the 4th. And so now 
Why? Why is he obsessed by maps? Look at this. There's, there's the... Uh, here we have both Anzac Corps attacking side by side for the first time. But there's one thing I want to show, and you don't have to go into the detail, but the detail is worth having a look at. And in fact, I will... Um, give this uh, my stick so that if anyone wants a copy of these slides so you can pour over the maps I'm uh, quite willing Jack, you can arrange that okay um, see that line I just put there that is the Flandern one line you know this one to two kilometres of pillboxes and wire and it's interesting, see how it goes off at an angle and if you look at the New Zealand division on the 4th and you can see their present line and the final objective they barely reach the Flandern 1 line it's still ahead of them look at the Australians, third Australians have to get into it. And the other Australian divisions are already fighting their way through it. Now, that is going to impact on the battles that we see on the 9th and the 12th. And so, and how? Well, 4th October, outstanding success, but there's a New Zealand infantry battalion moving forward, and that's typical of the ground after the 4th of October, from the evening of the 4th of October on. And look at the, the strength of those German defences and add the climate. And uh, they're the two brigades, and you can see, see that red line coming, that mass of trenches coming down the centre? Flandern one. And you can see the type of obstacle it is. And what's that little... Uh, the advanced dressing station is the large <coughs> blue line on the edge of the map. Uh, Otto Farm is one of the RAPs, but if you can get up to the Gravenstaffel Crossroads and Corrick, uh, just below one brigade, Berlin Wood and Waterloo, that's the extent <coughs> that the New Zealanders sees on the 4th. That advanced dressing station is the closest the field ambulance can get to the front line. So the stretcher bearers have to carry, if say someone's at Waterloo, it's a seven hour carry. And of course, ammunition and guns fall first before you bring out your wounded. So it's raining. And in fact, it would take relays of four to six men four relays of four to six men, 20 men, to bring out one stretcher case uh, in that seven hours. That's the underside. And of course, once you've got that, you want to keep advancing. There is only one road. See where the big blue line is? See that line that goes up and cuts between one brigade and four brigade, heads off a, a diagonal across the map. That is the only road available, and it's been pounded by both sides, and it takes 250 Maori pioneers and three horse teams to drag it from uh, the front, behind the front line, up to its position on one gun, up to its position on behind Grab and Hill. 
But we're talking about something like tied in with the division, 120 to 180 years. Now, and of course, how important is that gun? But it's not just the gun. You want 200 rounds of ammunition. You want sleepers, so you, because otherwise it will sink in the mud. And that's just for one gun. This is where it all founds. Medics, engineers, and ammunition logistics. And Russell writes that evening, unfortunately it is raining. And the sun hasn't the power to dry the ground so late in the year. We've got a very muddy time in front of us, and that means a lot. The mud is a much worse enemy than the Germans, who did not today put up much of a show of resistance. And there we see it. And as uh, Bert Stokes told me, he said, you know, gunfire always seemed to bring on the rain. And there was Bert, who was a gunner, and he said, I was in an island of mud with our gun. And all the wounded could see us, and so they gravitated towards us, because where else did they go? And he said, and that was typical. And the soldiers went through it up to their ankles, in some cases up to their knees. And oh, and Russell is conscious that it's about to all fall apart. And he takes Percival and walks him up that road so he can see what they're facing. How are we doing? I'll talk faster. And... However, Hay is really excited. He wants to push on. Now, he says, I'm sure they're ready to break. And if you, that highlighted yellow, said, wait a minute, Plumer, Army Commander, we just hit the leading elements. But Charles, who's uh, Hay's Director of Military Intelligence, disagrees. He says it's a hodgepodge. The Germans are in trouble. And so who does Haig listen to? He overrules Pluma. And Goff and Pluma are worried. But Haig senses. He can smell it. And after a full discussion, I decided that the next attack should be made two days earlier than already arranged. And uh, it's raining. I spoke to the French because the French are coming in and all I could persuade them to do was advance it by one day. It's the 4th, they're out on the 5th. Uh, it will uh, take place on the 9th. So these two British divisions have to come in and now, of course, uh, and you can sit, but once again, the map shows the extent there is something like 14 to 16 divisions, they're not counting the French. It's an enormous scale, and suddenly, every one of those divisions has to crank up because they've lost time. And so, and time is everything. But hey, sees that, but what about the guns? Because, uh, Owing to rain yesterday month was very bad, and so only enough guns have been pushed forward to cover tomorrow's attack. This is Godly reporting back to his army commander who's talking to Hay. You just saw pictures of what it was like to bring up one of those guns. If they can only cover tomorrow's attack, what happens? How soon, how many guns will they get up. It's estimated that on the night, because of the difficulties of going up that one road, only half the number of guns that took part in the 4th of October attack were available, and in most cases they didn't have the stable uh, supports or the ammunition. 
And so suddenly, the thing that the infantry rely on isn't there. And that shows it. And so the ninth is a bloody disaster. Except that's not the message that Hay gets. There's the report from Godly to Hay on the ninth. Notwithstanding this, 66th Division advanced without Barrington, took all the objectives. And the 49th game, all except a small piece on the left. Absolute bullshit. They're stuck on the start line. Uh, men are dead in the trenches. They're so shell shocked that they come out without their wounded and leave 127 stretcher cases for the New Zealand division when it moves in. Um, and of course, it's the ninth. Hague has advanced the timetable. The next, they'll come out on the 10th, and Hague wants Godley to attack with his New Zealanders and Wallace's his Australians on the morning of the 12th. And so they go in on the 11th, anticipating that the two British divisions are much further on than they actually are. And that the guns are up and that the medical and that's a photo on the morning of the 5th of October. And, it's been, and it rains for the following days up to the morning of the month. But you see the pillboxes and the relationship to the wire. Okay, there's a platoon here. How do you take that pillbox? Interesting question, isn't it? We won't we haven't got time to discuss that at this point. And I'm on the cosh. And so and wow, not another confusing map. The barrage map for the night. But where's passion map? See up in the top, uh, just off the centre before that dotted line, which is basic, uh, that's the village of Passchendaele. The guns of the ninth, the two British divisions, God, these two British divisions, can't reach Passchendaele because of the problems in getting them forward. Now, just look for Passchendaele when I show you the next barrage map and ask yourself a, and that's the Flandern one line that's that maze of German defences and you can see the poor buggers are got it right in front of them without enough artillery and they sh the machine gun the German machine gunners shoot them to pieces but Haig records the day as a great success because that's what he's told. Uh, he's a bit confused. Reports from 2nd Army show that progress on 2nd Anzac Corps front was not as great as 1st State. Notwithstanding this, it's a great success and push on. And Goff, Goff who's a real cavalryman, starts to have doubts. He, he thinks because of the weather, we should close it down. Hay won't listen to him. And now I get excited. I'll, uh, you can see the problem. Uh, see Passchendaele, which is that little thumb at the end. Uh, and the Germans will end up on three sides. What's happening now? They're starting to advance into a sack, and you're poking yourself into the sack. It's falling back on either side. The Germans are falling back on their artillery, and we're leaving ours behind. And Godley has no doubts. This is his moment to shine. He got a good tick from Messine, and now. Birdwood has got a great tick for men and wood and polygon wood. He wants 
a good tick for uh, gaining Passchendaele. Godley told me that they are determined to take Passchendaele in the next attack and will put an Australian flag on it. The advance will be then be over 2,000 yards. Now, to, up until now, because of the difficulties with artillery, it's been 1,000 max. But now Godley, really, all he's done is increase the barrage map without the capacity to provide or drag the artillery forward to make it happen. But the boss wants it, and anything the boss wants, he will get. And there's the road. And you can see the difficulties of trying to move forward. And here's that one. Oh my God, what's happened? Look at that. I was going to show you a flyer plan, and the gods have conspired against me. Uh, okay, so I can't. But essentially, what it would show you is Passchendaele, the village, covered by that barrage lines, and by now, uh, only something like a third of the guns were in position to provide cover. It, the barrage is so bad that the guns fire, sink in their trails, and land among the New Zealanders behind the start line. George King, Canterbury Battalion, is killed. The mortars, three-inch mortars, who are the battalion's own individual artillery, uh, uh, own artillery lands on the mortar dumps, destroys the mortars, and the ammunition that the guys have carried forward, it's a disaster. And what's worse, the pillboxes and the wire haven't been cut. And so that pockmarked slope picture that I showed you is reinforced by the Jaeger battalions who are the crack chaps. And if you look at this map, uh, the morass is that blue line. You can see uh, the British front line on October the 4th. Look at that dotted line, which is the line that we get to on the evening of the 4th of October. And despite the attack by uh, the two British divisions, see the yellow line that goes off in a bit of an angle? That is how far we get on the 12th. As we move forward, we'll be beaten by our own artillery and then advance up to our knees. And as we go forward, we see each shell hole is full of British dead and wounded who have been lying out there since the night. And you can see that mass of wire beyond the yellow line and uh, you can see that we don't get anywhere near the red line which is the first objective and we certainly don't get anywhere near passion now. and in fact observers artillery observers watching our fire advance in front of our infantry see after it hit us on the start line as it moved up the slope you couldn't tell there was a rolling barrage there so the key element to allow infantry to survive above ground has gone. It was never there. And it's a reality check. The latter, that's us, was held up by the machine gun fire soon after the start from Bellevue slopes to their front. But he talked about everyone else doing quite well. But the reality is, once again, when you study the German defences, <coughs> we had just reached it. The five British divisions on that side of us, uh, who all get a tick, are advancing towards it. So that's why uh, they gain that ground. And of course, 
Monash's division can't get forward until we get forward because we're going for the bit of high ground. And so, and there's, what are those little blue dots? There the regimental aid posts. And at Spree Farm you've got the advanced dressing station, casualty collecting post. And so, in terms of medical arrangements, 11th of October, stretcher bearers cleared 129 stretcher cases of the 49th Division who had been left behind. Just think of the disruption and disorganisation and despair in a brigade that moves out and leaves its wounded behind. Everything has broken. All the cohesion and the and the wounded lying there, and they said that as the rain came, you could tell the wounded uh, trying to stay above the water line. They said the shell holes full with water, and then slap, slip back in and drown. And so that's and if you look at the rest of it, 12th of October at the advanced dressing station, only 49 stretches. Walking wounded reached the advanced dressing station exhausted. Six stretcher bearers, seven hour carry to spree farm. Thigh mud from those uh, blue dots that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, 200 stretcher cases at Waterloo, a five kilometre carry involving 20 stretcher bearers per stretcher. Uh, 4 pm. ADS 78 line, 214 sitting and 440 walking there, waiting to be taken back for, towards Ypres. It estimated that the 230 stretcher cases would take 1,200 men to carry them back. And of course, gas gangrene sets in if you don't evacuate a wounded within 12 hours. The New Zealanders don't finish clearing the October, 12th October battlefield until the 14th. Break, actually on the day itself, uh, there's initial plans uh, to see if they can renew the attack in the afternoon at 3 p.m. Of course, that's impossible. We hold uh, a little bit on the left with a mix of the rifle brigades and we're stuck on the start line looking up at Bellevue Spur and eventually Russell persuades Godley that it's impossible to carry out the attack. And there's uh, the pillbox and that's the message Braithwaite sends to Russell on the 13th. And finally, there's a British brigade, there's the pioneers, there's everyone who can be sent for going out carrying a stretch of puppets. And uh, 30 of which are under cover and a balance of 40, which are still lying in the open, if not removed tonight will die. This is most urgent. And so all the dreams at Messine and on the 4th of October come to naught. And there's the face of a New Zealand stretcher bearer in late October. And we become obsessed with ourselves. And on the 12th, it's rightly so. But there is the Knights uh, Scottish Division, who's on our left, immediately after the New Zealand Division, in 5th Army, 18th Corps. And uh, Haig says they were successful. Look at what the Scots thought. Attacked on the left of the New Zealand Division on the 12th of October, rain and mud constitute 
this chief explanation for the failure of the division in this battle, which should not have been fought. But the reason why it was fought is because the corps commander facing the vital ground of Passchendaele in his corps area believed without all the warning signs being obvious uh, that he could do it. And that was gone. And so no artillery and men attacking forward into the face of wire and machine guns. And if you look at Monash's experience and the other divisions, it mirrors that experience. And so it's a reality check for Hay. Uh, but he's always positive. Army's commanders explained the situation. All agreed that the mud and the bad weather prevented troops getting on yesterday. I said that our immediate objective was the massive high ground around Passchendaele. If anyone's been to Passchendaele, you'll look hard for the massive high ground, but it is important. The Canadians would come in, and the Canadians would finally take Passchendaele, take that little finger of ground uh, at a cost of 17,000 cash. And it was agreed that even though they would hold the ground, it was untenable. The best line to winter over on was the line seized by the New Zealanders on the 4th of October. And that's looking down towards Bellevue Spur, the high ground. Uh, the white pillbox on the left is Waterloo Farm. And, if, and that painting by Butler is taken from where the New Zealand monument is today. And on the evening of the 12th, morning of the 13th, from that pillbox all the way up to where the monument is, was a line of casualties side by side because that road, even though it was pockmarked by shells, was the only firm ground. And so they dragged the casualties onto the road and the German machine gunners and snipers up on the high ground left them alone. Okay. Russell fesses up. He takes responsibility. Um, we were brought in on the 11th oh, to renew the attack on the morning of the 12th. This, though not an entire failure, was very nearly so. Uncut wire was the cause. We as a divisional staff assumed that the wire had been cut. Assumption in war is radically wrong if by any means in your power you can eliminate the uncertain. This is a letter to the Minister of Defence, James Allen. Allen. And it's interesting because this is the only letter of its type that I can find from a general in battle saying the buck stops with me because he finishes the letter with in these days of parliamentary criticism questions may be asked as to the operations I refer to the somewhat bald and concise statement I have made accurately represents the position and his next meeting of his brigadiers he spoke about the crime which he and his staff had committed. And Godley, his corps commander, says something different. New Zealand Division had another big fight on the 12th of October. You can read the rest. Let me go down a bit. They were successful in crossing the river and establishing themselves on part of the spur but did not quite succeed in getting all of it. None of it would be better. And, but it, it was a very good day's work, and the division, again, did excellently. The casualties were about the same as last time, and the two added up together, though not unduly heavy, necessitate the provision of a good many reinforcements. So a good day 
at the office for Godley. And of course, as I mentioned, the Canadians are then sent in. Curry does it slowly and deliberately, and but at cost. And it scarred New Zealand then. We carry the scars now. That's the 207 memorial. And Carver, perhaps the best volume of the original official histories, wrote at the end of his Passchendaele chapter, we find that the division lost nearly 7,500 men during the month of October. By these losses, the division had reached such a degree of exhaustion as to render it temporarily unfit for further oper active operations. Added to the weakness caused by fatigue, sickness, and depleted numbers was a generally felt depression consequent upon our lack of success at Passchendaele and a certain dimming of ardour from which the division was slow to recover. It was broken and no longer fit for common. But it was in good company. Haig's ambition came close to destroying two of his armies. Thank you very much.